Hi gang, Rob here. It's the evening of 23 March 2015 and this is installment 3.0 of my traditional knife pilgrimage or TKP 3.0 and within that anthology will be four parts just on Great Eastern Cutlery and this is the first of those four and part one of of the Great Eastern Cutlery series is going to cover uh, the display cases at GEC in the public areas as well as some footage of the factory store at GEC and this part of the tour is going to be given to us by Christine Chris Tucker who's the customer service manager for GEC she also handles bookkeeping purchasing human resources. She does pretty much everything that needs to be done in the office of a middle-sized manufacturing company. Um, and she is wonderful and what a sweet, sweet soul she is. Took lots of time out of her day just to pay attention to a measly little YouTuber who loves traditional knives. And thank you, Chris, for doing that. I really, really appreciate it. So let's get started, shall we? You're going to love this. Here on the Thursday, the 19th of March, 2015, I'm going to visit Great Eastern Cutlery this morning. I'm going to spend a few hours talking with uh, Chris Tucker, the customer service and jack of all office trades and with William Howard that would be the owner Bill Howard's son who is very very involved in day-to-day -day operations with GEC and maybe we'll even have a chance to spend a few minutes with Bill Howard who is the greatest conservator of the traditional knife uh, industry we have in this country anyway well guys here we are We've arrived in Titusville, Pennsylvania, and we're walking up to the worldwide headquarters of, you guessed it, Great Eastern Cutlery, ready to take a factory tour. Well, hey, good morning, gang. We are here in Titusville, Pennsylvania at Great Eastern Cutlery, up here on the catwalk hallway with customer service queen, Christine Tucker. Tucker. If you guys email or call into GEC, you've probably talked to Chris. And she's gonna sort of show us around today. Uh, so we're gonna take a little video and maybe watch some knives be made, and talk about some history. So Chris, why don't you show us around? Okay, um, you wanna start off with our display? We sure. usually start off and show people what we've done, what we do. Chris is a little camera shy, so we're gonna keep her behind the camera with me. <laughs> well, we opened in August of 2006 and shipped our first knife out in March of 2007. So as you can see on the display, 2006, we didn't have a whole lot to choose from. We had two different styles and very limited handle material. So, in the upper left here, these are 2006 knives. Right. And which pattern numbers are those, Chris? The large ones on the left would be our number 23, and then the smaller ones are our number 73. Still making those now? Yes, we are. And then as we move down, we're into 2007. And as you can see, each year it kind of grows. More patterns, more handle materials. We're at the point now where we try and have a brand new pattern about every six to eight weeks. Sometimes it doesn't always quite get that fucking weight, but we try. And I'm noticing, even back in the early days, I see some acorn shields and some Northfield unexcelled and Tidute shields. So were right. you making all three lines back in the early days even? Yes, we were. We own all three trademarks. And now the acorn, the shield, acorn would be... shield would designate the Great Eastern line, which were predominantly 440C stainless steel blades. Gotcha. 
Now your Northfield and your Titty Uter, your 1095 carbon steel. The, both of them are same quality, workmanship, everything. The only difference between them is cosmetic differences between the Titty Uter and the Northfield. The Northfield is more of the high-end line where, if you can see, they'll often have lined or pinched bolsters, slanted bolsters. Um, more exotic or expensive handle materials will go on your Northfield line. For Titty, it was more what we call the working hand line. It's now, funny, when I first started buying GEC knives, I'd always buy the Northfield. Mm -hmm. And then, as time goes by using them, uh, I sort of like the satin blade, so I bought more Titty Utes. More Titty Utes, yeah. Well, I'm glad to know you used them, because that's what we make them for. <laughs> well, I did. So, 2008, we're pretty much exposed. We have a big product line by that. Yes. Yeah, I see some stag knives here in the 2008 case. You guys are pretty proud of your stag process, aren't you? We try and match them up as best we can from front to back, both color, texture. And you know, lots they, of natural stag, not all of it's burned. No, not all of it is burned. Then some of the more fun cover materials, lots of acrylic down here. Some Delrin. And then there's two things that catch my eye in this 2008 case. Uh, there's an abalone. Is that a 73? Down yes. There in the mm -hmm. Corner and uh, uh, what's the other one? I just <laughs> we have a small pearl one over here on the side. Uh -huh. Now tell me about your abalone because it's pretty special. Well, what it is, it's, we can have abalone in almost any color. What it actually is, is you get a colored backing, uh -huh. then it's a thin sheet of abalone <laughs> with a sheet of acrylic over the top. And that would be what we call looking glass looking abalone? Glass, yes. And then you do some LVS ab abalone too. Right, which that would actually be the laminated veneer sheet, and which is what LVS stands for. Laminated veneer sheet. Right. So many of them stacked on top of each other. Exactly. So you're not just looking at one little thin sheet of abalone covered not by acrylic. Not necessarily. Sometimes they will have a couple of layers of it to give that depth look. Right. Uh, we were talking in your office about uh, the way that you process your slabs. Mm -hmm. You cut them all, size them all, jig them all here. Yes. Our bone comes into us in the round. It's um, beef cow, either femur or shin bones, and they'll be cut to just certain length, random lengths, and they're all cleaned and processed when they arrive to us. Then we will cut the slabs off them, around them as many slabs as we can get. Then from there, we will take them down, and as you'll see the machine as we go through, and that will shape it to the outside of the knife. Then they will go ahead and jig it, which is cutting the pattern in the top of the bone. And then from there, we'll dye it whatever color we decide to do. Wow. So now we move on to some more 08 knives up here. And some 09s. Up here in this top case, tell me about these ones in the middle, Chris. Those are your typical sunfish patterns. A lot of people call it an elephant toe, a sunfish, a rope knife, and it's pretty much the same name for the same And those style. have, uh, those sure. have an interesting history, don't they, that, that pattern? Yes. Um, the blade is thicker on the spine of it, it is a larger blade. What they would use it for would be like on your ocean-going cargo vessels or your um, oil derricks where you have the big, thick ropes, and they would be able to lay the blade on the rope, hit it on the back of the spine of the blade with a wooden mallet and that was sliced down through that rope. So that's a traditional pocket knife that's designed to, to be set on a piece of media <laughs> and whacked with a hammer on the spine. Pretty much. <laughs> huh. And we think these modern folders are hard use knives. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some hard use knives right there. Yes they are. I see in the early years you were making a lot of the 53, 54 patterns, big knives. A lot of them are that. I mean, we just kind of started 
Mexico would design the knife. Uh, it just kind of probably happened that way. That, uh, like the 53, you can make many variations. Right. And you can make it as a moose, you can make it as a, um, you know, a jack. You can make it as a three blade, a four blade. No, that's a, that, that pattern name, moose, what does that mean exactly? That's one I've never quite been able to figure out. A moose is just pretty much two different blades at opposite ends. Okay. Where like a muskrat would be the same blades at opposite ends. And a jack would usually be a both blades on one end. A jack is both blades on one, blade end. on one right. end. Gotcha. See, I'm here, I'm here to learn today. So now we move down to more 09s. Some large toothpicks there. That's a pattern I haven't seen much from you guys lately. No, we haven't made them probably since, I'm gonna say maybe 2012 may have been our last run of those. We'll get back to it eventually. We always do. And then about 2010, it looks like some more of the, the smallish patterns started to pop up. Mm -hmm. <clears> There's <throat> a beautiful abalone muskrat. So what changed in these early years, like from 06 to 2010, what did you guys learn and do differently? I think I'm just quality-wise about people trained. You know, when you first start out, there's not too many people in Titusville that actually know how to make a knife. So you're taking just people off the street and spending time and teaching them and how did, to make a knife. So did GE start GEC start with a a fresh green workforce, not cutlers? Pretty much, yes. We did hire a few that had some knowledge, which we put in key places to get us going and also to be able to help train other new ones coming in. But pretty much, yeah, they're all pretty much green when they come in. Wow. <laughs> so now we're down to 2011. <clears throat> ah, I see uh, the first appearance of the, the bullnose or sodbuster pattern there in 2011. Yeah first appearance of our farm and field line. So that is the f number 47 yes. chassis, which got, yeah, they got some new life breathed into it last year, didn't it? Mm-hmm. By the Viper, the Viper yeah. yes. Well, a lot of guys bought Vipers and then went back in time, sort of, and picked up a, a bullnose sodbuster, because you ran some of those last year, too. Yeah. <clears throat> So what's this long one here, Chris, and the, with the abalone covers? Okay, that would be our Ben Hogan. That's what I thought. Okay, pack. never never seen one of those in and, person. And it's, a lot of people ask, but the Ben Hogan is not the, the golfer. It's not Hogan. the golfer. <laughs> and then here, here's a, what's this, what do we call these bolsters, Chris? On the, the Those bottom? are a barn hinge bolster. The barn hinge bolster. We call the whole knife a Templar. Gotcha. And. The Mako ran with, uh, there was a run of the Mako late that last year that had the Templar yes. bolsters on it. Luckily we can take a lot of different patterns and adapt them to do a Templar if we so desired. Well, that looks like a lot of knives in 2011, that was a big year. Getting bigger though, isn't it? Yeah, each year just keeps growing. Well, here's something interesting I see in the 2013 case. That is a, on that number 47, what's the handle material there? That is orange Delrin. That is orange Delrin, okay. We'll use both orange and black Delrins, especially on the farm and field line. We'll use knife bright acrylic, which will glow in the dark. We have started using some micarta materials, both linen and canvas. Now, micarta is an interesting material, I think. A lot of guys think that's brand new. No. 
It's not, is it? No. Micarta, a lot of Micarta, I think, is used for insulation, electrical insulation, even. Now, how long has it really been used in traditional knife covers? That, I'm not sure. I mean, I just know when we started using it, Bill obviously knew about it. But how far back that really goes, I don't know. Well, oh, here's a, a number 47 we don't see a lot of. The Hawkbill, what do we call that? That was the Hang Helper. The Hang Helper. And then up in the upper right. Those are, our, well, one is our number 99 lockback. The top one is our new number 65, I think the pattern is, or 63 fish knife. Gotcha. It's got and the lockback is called a farmer. Scaler, right? and, pardon? The lockback is just called a farmer, isn't it? It's a farmer. Yeah. Yep. Farmer Dad. A good friend of mine, Campfire Talk on YouTube, has one of those in the uh, green micarta. That's sort of his material of choice. <laughs> he loves that knife. And then you guys do some fixed blades too on occasion. Yes, we do. Around Titusville, Pennsylvania is a big hunting area. Right. So we do do a few fixed blades with leather sheaths. The sheets are all USA made also, the same as our knives are. So. Do you have a local maker for your sheets? Um, actually, we're using a, a gentleman out of Michigan Really? at the moment. Okay, I was wrong. 2013 and 2014 finish up here. And all the 2014s aren't even out here yet. And 2014 was a huge, huge year. And we have to get some more display cases and get the rest of the 2014 and the beginning of 2015 out. So this is like a little historical artifact room here, huh? Yeah. Well, that's our store. So we've got... Now those pictures are actually pictures that were given to us by Tysel Redevelopment Authority and it actually shows this building being built in the mid-1950s. Wow. And this building was the metallurgical lab for Universal Cyclops Steel. Yes. A company that's probably no longer, no? I think they are, but they are not in Titusville anymore. Gotcha. But I do think they have a couple of divisions still. And here, here's something I've been interested to see in person, because I see them on your website. These uh, small posters are, are they're essentially the tube wraps blown up right the labels blown up yes suitable for framing yes a bargain at only eight dollars each all right what else we got is this a magazine article that was written yes so this here's was a, featured in the Blade magazine in January of 2009. When, when you were just a baby. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> well, when GEC was just when a baby. GEC was a baby, yeah. Pretty much. We'd only been open a few years by that time. Anything that, after we make it, that doesn't ship out to distributors or, or private collectors or anybody that has, you know, come through and asked... To purchase a knife, the excess comes in here. And then the store is open Monday through Friday from 7 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. So these knives are for sale in the GEC store. And these are knives that have been manufactured, were not shipped to distributors, and are for sale here. And Chris, tell me again the Hours of operation of the GEC store? Then Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Of course, Eastern Time. I have a feeling, guys, not all these are still going to be here when I leave. Now, pretty much everything in this case is our Titty Ute line. Okay. We do have some of the Great Easterns on this one end. I do not own one Great Eastern. We can change that. Great Eastern. 
And then in here we just have like odds and ends, like our blade keys, you know, tube openers, letter openers, um, our new number H20 hunter packs, which are pretty much a mix and match. You can buy one singly or you can buy them as a double and you can mix and match blade style, handle color. So it looks like those come in uh, a worn cliff, sort of a clip and kind of a bull nose, huh? And we have um, the worn cliff we're actually calling a caping okay. blade. Then you have your muskrat clip and then you have your drop point and then you have your bird hook, bird gut hook that would go. Really? Yeah. And you can either buy it singly and buy a single sheath. Where you get the double or you sheath. can buy a two pack and buy a double sheath. Which looks curiously them. like a GEC acorn. Yeah, those we actually made in house. Aren't those? Those sheets. are something. We have made here. Uh, and then we have the GEC cap. Practical knives. Boy, that's a great slogan for a cap. And this is what our bone looks like when it comes into us before oh, we I, start processing it. I almost it. got your face on camera. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> What we'll do is take the bone, we'll take slabs off the sides, as many as we can get that are straight, pretty much not too curved. If it's too curved, of course we can't use it, but this is what it looks like when it comes into us. Then wow. we'll come in and, and drum. And that and drum of it. is the side of your knife. Yes. I was going to say as you were holding that up, it looks much like a bone you'd buy for a dog, and you even sell, it looks oh, like yes. elk horn. Yes, we do. Four dogs. Yeah, what we'll do... On the elk, our elk horn, we'll take our slabs off the side. Then ones that are curved, like say this part here, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to use. And we just have them laying around. You go to like PetSmart to buy an elk horn dog chew, and they're charging like $25, $35. We were at a show about four weeks ago, three weeks ago, lady was selling them for $52 <laughs> for a dog chip. <laughs> and that was off fall for you guys. Scraps almost. Yeah. yeah. It is pretty much scrap for us yeah. and we just sell it for $7. Well, there you go. I mean, you know, dogs like it. It's all natural. It doesn't splinter like a normal bone will being antler. Huh. And no elk died to provide that chew toy. No. Those are all sheds that have been picked up by our supplier. Well, we've got another case over here. These look now, like the Northfield here, case. Over here we have some of our fixed blades. We have a few of our kitchen. We um, do a slicing, a paring, and a steak knife in kitchen wear. And then the rest of the case is the Northfield. So those are some 99. Uh, what, did we, what was that pattern the called Street. last year? The Wall Street. Warren Cliffs. And natural stag or is that burnt stag? Uh, I think there's a little bit of both in there. Okay. That's a knife I didn't buy yeah, last year. Your bottom year. one and your third one up are burnt stag. The one in the middle is a natural. Okay. So kind of uh, consistent with the literature on your, on your tube labels, if the natural looks beautiful like it is, Mm -hmm. You use it that way, and then you burn it to make it look like the good natural almost. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, some people just do like burnt stag, so we do do it both ways. Yeah, that's a pattern I didn't buy last year, and have you ever talked to a guy named Steve Denton from Florida? Mm-hmm. Yes. He loves that knife. He bought one and I didn't. He he and I do a, a video series together. Uh -huh. He he sends me knives with research, and then I do a video of it and pretty much read his research on camera. He is ah, neat. Well, he he's the guy's crazy. He's obsessed. Ninety nines <laughs> are a nice one. They have a very nice, smooth, easy opening and closing. And. A really good lockback. You guys have gotten better at that over the years, yes, haven't we? Yes, we have. Yeah. So tell me about tube poppers. Tube poppers. 
Some of times, but that, you have to open a whole there, lot right? of tubes. Yeah, you have to open a whole lot of tubes. It can really make the thumb sore. So this end of it will open your tube. The top end of it, well, you can use as a blade key to open your blades. So if and you're then in the middle, you can open your your bottles with it. Uh, <laughs> what would be in the bottle? Pop. <laughs> Beer. <laughs> so the blade key is for nail biters, people without the who don't yes. have thumbnails. Gotcha. <clears throat> and then over here, looks like we've got some Great Eastern Cutlery sportswear. And we have two different style shirts. We have the T-shirt and the polo shirt, both. Now the polo shirt just has the emblem on the front. There's nothing on the back. But the Great Eastern, the t-shirt one does say Great Eastern Cutler on the front. And just like the hat, it's got the Practical Knives emblem on the back of the shirt. Gotcha. Well, you see, guys, I told you that you would enjoy that. And I know you did. What a great look into the first nine years or so of Great Eastern Cutlery history. And at some pretty cool items in the store. If any of that stuff looks attractive to you, don't hesitate to give Chris a call. And I will include uh, GEC's contact information, Chris's email address, websites, phone numbers, all that good stuff, in the description of this video. Now, please stay tuned for parts two through four, or parts four through six, depending on whether you're talking about just the GEC series or the entire traditional knives pilgrimage. Um, we're going to cover every aspect of how a GEC knife uh, comes from raw material to finished product in these next three videos. Uh, the next one will be uh, manufacturing beginning through tanging. Um, yeah, you'll have to watch the video to find out what that means, won't you? Uh, that will be handled by William Howard. And then the third video in the GEC series will be blade grinding through assembly. Uh, and that part of the tour will be continued by uh, William Howard with a special appearance by master janitor and assembler, owner of the company, Bill Howard. And then the final part will be hafting through finishing and sharpening. And uh, they're all going to be wonderful and uh, Please watch. If you're a traditional knife guy, or you know what, even if you're a modern folder guy that has a little bit of your spirit tugging at you to look back, um, watch these videos. They are pretty special, and this company is pretty special. That's all for this one, though. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the word is sharp. <laughs>